This is Center Stage, putting your firm in the spotlight by highlighting business owners and other industry experts to help take your firm to the next level. Hey everyone, and welcome to Center Stage. I'm your host, John Henson. And this week we are being joined by a former practicing lawyer who has now become a coach and a trainer, now the CEO of The Lawyer's Edge, which is also a podcast, which you should definitely check out. Uh, and that is Elise Holtzman. Uh, she's going to be, we're going to talk about just a wide ranging uh, set of things just around setting up your firm for success and, and uh, really give you a good uh, bit of insight into the things that Elise helps lawyers out with. So Elise, thanks for joining us. I'm thrilled to be here, John. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. So, you know, I kind of, you know, gave the broad strokes introduction there, uh, where you came from and other, but, you know, what, tell us a little bit more about your background and why you transitioned out of being a practicing lawyer to what you're doing now with the Lawyer's Edge. Sure. So I graduated from law school a long time ago, uh, went into straight into big law in New York City. I didn't know anything different. I didn't come from a family of lawyers and I also had a lot of loans to pay off. So I went to a couple of big law firms in Manhattan and I was working in the area of commercial real estate transactions, which I absolutely loved. I loved doing deals. Back then we used to get together in big, big conference rooms with a million documents and a million people. So it was very exciting. Um, I wound up uh, leaving the practice of law kind of grudgingly. I, I loved what I did. I was happy at my firm in general, but, um, you know, there were, there were no women mentors back then. Mm -hmm. I had amazing mentors and sponsors who were, um, all men with stay at home wives. And so they were incredible. And I learned so much from them, but ultimately my husband and I, my husband's also a big law lawyer, by the way. So we had a baby. Um, I'm afraid to tell you how old the baby is, but anyway, <laughs> that we had this baby and we kind of tried to make it work. It was like a bad movie. I mean, you know, pulling all nighters and working all weekend and trying to make it work. And, you know, there was no such thing as part time back then, but they let me try it. And I was, you know, supposed to work 40 hours a week as, as a part time gig. And I was still working 70 hours a week. So it was just Jeez. nuts. And I thought, well, you know what? I, I tried this thing. It doesn't work. Um, I was sort of annoyed about the whole thing. And at the same time, because I felt like it wasn't my choice. And at the same time, recognized that most women didn't have the luxury of staying home with their kids, which is what I wound up doing. So I wound up being home with kids for a while. And then about 15 years ago, 16 years ago, maybe uh, decided that it was time to figure out what I was going to be when I grew up. And I found out about executive and leadership coaching did a full year certificate program in that, and then started the lawyer's edge. So I've been doing this, um, you know, the, I've been in business for almost exactly 15 years now um, and work exclusively with lawyers and law firms on a variety of things uh, that they didn't teach us in law school. The most prominent of those being business development and leader development. Awesome. So yeah. And, you know, I, I know that you're just a, an absolute wealth of information on this. And the first question that I had for you, and I've seen this term floating around, I've been working with lawyers for nine years. I've seen this term uh, every now and then, and hopefully this doesn't make me sound too ignorant, but like, I'm still not entirely sure what it entails. And that is the term rainmaking. And I know that you do a lot with this. What exactly is rainmaking and, and what all does that encompass? So it depends who you talk to. Um, rainmaking is really about being able to consistently bring in a significant amount of client business to your firm. And so that can often be new clients, depending on the firm. And it can often be, you know, keeping people that are already clients very happy and bringing in new matters on a consistent basis. A rainmaker is somebody who's bringing in enough work that they are keeping other people in the law firm busy. So there's leverage there, right? You're not just bringing in business that you're going to sit and do. You're bringing in business that is going to help you grow the firm by having more people working kind of under your umbrella. And so some people will say that rainmaking is when somebody's bringing in a tremendous amount of business and it's somehow different from calling someone, you know, a good business developer. I think they're the same thing. These are terms that we okay. use interchangeably, uh, but it's really about being able to, for lack of a better term, make the cash register ring, um, okay. both for yourself and for other people in the firm. Got it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't sure if it was, you know, kind of the is synonymous with the whole the slang of making it rain, you know, with with the cash and the revenue. But that that is good because I, I think that 
does help frame kind of the next few questions I was going to ask, because, you know, you talk about being a rainmaker and that involves, you know, having, bringing in enough work for other people to do, but the starting point of that is going out and finding good people to do that work. And so, you know, I know that, I mean, there are so many people that we work with and that we're connected with that help law, law firms attract talent. Um, I know how we do it here internally. Obviously, we're not a law firm, you know, but we work with lawyers, so we know how we try to attack, attract talent. What what things should a law firm be doing, you know, whether it's with their hiring process or onboarding or whatever, you know, what what sort of things do you sort of tell people when it comes to helping them attract and then also retain the rock stars and the really good team members uh, for a firm? So the Lawyer's Edge does not do hiring. However, mm -hmm. right, so we're not an executive search firm or a lawyer search firm. However, we do often have these conversations with our clients for the reasons you suggested, right? They're looking to grow their firms. They want the right people to be there. They want people that are going to stay with them, right? It's not good for any law firm to have a lot of turnover. We have more of it in today's world than we used to, right? People leave to go pursue other opportunities more than they traditionally did. Um, but it is something that's top of mind for all law firm leaders. And so first of all, I think it's important to have a really good understanding of what your culture is and what your values are. And if you're just looking to hire people from quote unquote, the right law schools or with a certain pedigree, um, I think that you're going to run into trouble because people need to fit, right? They, they need to fit in. And it doesn't mean they all need to look alike, right? We're not talking about that, but do these people share your values? Are they rowing in the same direction? Do they want the kinds of things that um, make sense for them to want based on what your firm delivers or what your firm is looking to achieve? Another thing is that many firms hire without any, any understanding of the business of law. So the people they're hiring don't understand the business of law and the people doing the hiring are often paying more attention to, you know, what technical legal skills do you have? What other law firm did you come out of? What law school did you come out of? So that they wind up hiring for pedigree or a list of types of matters that person has worked on rather than understanding that long-term it's important for these folks to also have an interest in the business of law, running a law firm, bringing business into the law firm, being part of potentially in the future, the leadership of the law firm, taking a longer view so that you're more likely to hire the right people. And so I'll just give one example that comes to mind for me. Um, there is a litigation boutique in a large city uh, that I've done some work with, and they're about 30 to 35 lawyers, depending on, you know, what, what's going on. And they have, they always have hired for pedigree. So the guys that started the firm came out of big law firms in the eighties. They started this law firm. They had business. They were doing pretty well. It was kind of natural for them. And they said, we need more people. And so they went around hiring lawyers from, you know, the best law schools in the U S and Canada. And what wound up happening was some years later, as the older lawyers, the senior lawyers were starting to slow down and retire, they realized that there was quite literally nobody in the firm except one guy that you know was in the second generation that generated business. And so now all of a sudden you're looking ahead and saying, oh my goodness, we hired these incredible lawyers. Many of them are people who love to sit at their desk and, and grind out really, really good legal work product. But there's nobody here that is interested in helping us grow the firm, helping us lead the firm um, and helping us bring in the right kinds of clients. So I think it is important for law firms to take a longer view when they're hiring. You know, it may not be easy to identify who those folks are going to be, but I do think that it's important to at least have conversations with people so that they understand that you're not just hiring them to grind out some good legal work for a couple of years. You are interested in hiring them for the, for the long term and the contributions that they can make to the firm, um, you know, are going to be important and that you kind of want to have a sense of what they think those look like. As yeah. far as retention goes, yeah, go ahead. Well, and, and to that point, you know, it, in, in all the years that I've been doing this and, and all the conversations and everything, it, I, I've noticed like this very strange 
relationship here because, you know, lawyers inherently, you know, whether they believe it themselves or they've been told this this entire their entire lives, they're incredibly intelligent, incredibly intelligent, very smart, can process a lot of information. But for whatever reason, and whether it's just because they assume the business of law and business of running a law firm is just kind of something that comes with it and they they should be able to figure it out or whatever. But it seems like they're always really good at being a lawyer, but then they a lot of times struggle with that business side of things. And it's just so interesting. And like, we've always talked about how, well, it's because they don't teach you how to run a business in law school or whatever, but is it, you know, is it just because it takes two completely different skill sets, two completely different parts of your brain. Like, why why is that struggle so prevalent with lawyers? I think there are a couple of reasons there. So you mentioned the idea that they don't teach us stuff, this stuff in law school, and they absolutely don't. I mean, I have this, you know, th- this joke that we get two things in, I mean, it's not totally a joke, but we, we get two things in law school. You know, one is we get a foundation in the law. So they teach us torts and constitutional law and contracts and criminal law, all that good stuff. And then they teach you how to think like a lawyer. So you can never think like a normal person again, <laughs> uh, which is totally true. Like just go to buy like an office chair or something and you're, re- you know, you're sort of looking at the fine print. But the idea idea is that they then say, you know, congratulations, you're a lawyer, go have a great career. And their job is done. And it is, it's done. You leave law school. But they never mention all of the things that are important in running a law firm, in running a business, or even in, you know, learning to motivate people and, you know, all of the sorts of things that hiring and firing, as we just discussed, all of the things that come to be critical in terms of running, not just a law firm, but also other organizations, in-house legal departments, you know, government agencies, those sorts of things. So we don't get any of that. On top of that, though, think about who self-selects into law school, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody set, comes to us and says, you're going, you know, you're going to law school, John, you have no choice. We make the choice to go into law school. And so most people aren't going into law school because they wanted to become salespeople. If they had wanted to become salespeople, they would have gone and become salespeople and done something different. Most people aren't going into law school because they're tremendous risk takers. Mm-hmm. So research has been done on the personality types that most often show up in law school and then in the legal profession. And those are people who are typically not big picture thinkers, future focused, right? They're very good at detail work. They're very good at executing on concrete specific tasks, very Mm -hmm. good at problem solving, right? They kind of like time and structure. And so these are not the people that are thinking in law school about how am I going to run a business? I mean, it didn't even, when I tell you I worked at a big law firm, literally never crossed my mind, not joking. I didn't grow up around entrepreneurs. My dad always worked for a company. My mom always worked for a school system. Um, Somebody else ran the business. I did the work that they gave me. And so it becomes clearer when you're in a smaller firm pretty quickly, right? Because, you know, if you're not bringing in the business and you're not running the firm, the phone, you know, the, the, somebody's going to turn the electricity off. Um, So you have to pay more attention to that. But I do think that it's a combination of things. And then um, certainly at, at some of the larger law firms and even law firms that are smaller, but, you know, have a, a, a sophisticated practice, let's say, or they're not as focused on their junior people, you know, running the firm, they say to their junior lawyers, listen, bill, 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 right? And look, even if you're in a contingency firm or whatever it is, the the money isn't getting made unless somebody's working and billing the time. So no one is saying, hey, when you're a first year associate, even a fifth year associate, most of the time, let's pay attention to the business of law. No, it's all about Get become a good lawyer, be a good technician, get the work done, keep the client happy, and bill, bill, bill. And so I'm not, you know, I'm I'm very, I don't really criticize lawyers for not knowing how to do this stuff. Rather than saying like, right, and it is more like observation. And yeah. rather than saying like, my God, why are these people so terrible? It's, it's almost like, why wouldn't they be terrible? Right. Because they didn't self-select because they wanted to do these things. And then they weren't taught these things. And then they get to the law firm and the law firm doesn't teach those things either for the most part, unless you're in a very unusual place. And so I think that that's really the reasoning um, behind the results that we see in that regard. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of that perfect storm, like you mentioned, especially with just kind of the personality types where they are just really focused on being down in the weeds and executing. And then also 
being very risk averse. And, you know, when you open up a business, there's a, a ton of risk always in, in, in a lot of different things that you do. And then you also find out, okay, well, now I need to entrust a marketing vendor or I need to entrust, um, you know, a, a bookkeeper and all this. I have to now place my entire livelihood almost into the hands of maybe other right. people, or I have to f- figure out how to do this all myself. And that's, I think that's where we see a lot of this friction showing up. One of the things that I say to people, and I think this is really important when it comes to moving ahead as an attorney, in the early part of your career as an attorney, for most people, that ability to be in the weeds, to be focused on the details, to execute and run something across the finish line is immensely valuable. And so you can imagine you get to a law firm and they want you to dot those I's. They they need you to cross those T's. They need you to proofread the document and get things perfect and get things right because that's what they're paying you for, right? That is quite literally your job because somebody else is up here, right? And, yeah. and like at a higher level and delegating work down to you. Having said that, as you become more senior, your role shifts. And so this is for everybody, not just for attorneys, right? But as you become more senior, your job becomes more about managing people and projects and getting stuff done, even if you're not the one doing it, and less about your individual contribution to, you know, writing the brief or whatever it may be. That shift is not easy for many people to make. Um, The people that maybe have a harder time earlier as a lawyer because they're bigger picture thinkers and those details make them want to you know, shoot themselves. It's easier for them to shift sometimes into those leadership roles because they naturally see the big picture. They naturally are willing to look out and say, how can I get this done rather than ha- with all these people and resources and rather than how can I do it myself? So what we're asking people to do is say, well, you've been a really, really good associate for all these years. And now we want you to help run the firm, which is a completely different skill set. Yeah. Right. And so most people don't wake up in the morning and say, I have a really great idea. This stuff that has worked really well for me for 35 or 40 years, what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw all that out the window and I'm going to start doing something completely different and change my skills up completely overnight. Nobody does that. Right. And so I think that for, if, if, people are in a position now where they're looking to either become somebody who is uh, more senior, uh, becomes a leader, wants to become a rainmaker, or you are um, a managing partner or a law firm leader that's looking at some of your people and you want to help them get there. I think that explaining that shift and saying, listen, over the next few years, there are some different kinds of skills that we would like you to learn um, that we think will be instrumental to you succeeding in in this second part of your career. I think that helping the people turn the light bulb on to see that they can't keep doing the same thing they've always done, even though they've been doing it successfully, it mm-hmm. is very, very important because I don't think most people recognize that that's going to happen. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because it helps us kind of uh, transition back into the the original path we were going down in this conversation. And I'm glad that we kind of went down that tangent a little bit. But when it comes to retaining those those best employees, is that is that really like one of the best ways to do it is to kind of help them develop those additional skills that like, you know, to kind of prevent them from getting in that rhythm of doing what they've always done and kind of elevating them into into, you know, and, and adding those more skills? Yes, John, I think that's exactly what it's about is is recognizing what the skills are, what the behaviors are, right? The habits, what the mindsets are that are required for success as a more senior attorney, as a law firm leader, as a rainmaker, whatever it is that this person wants to achieve or you want this person to achieve, and then investing in them. And I'm not necessarily talking about money. It could be money and and you know probably you could you could look at it as as dollars and cents but investing in these people um and and helping them grow first of all that's what you know millennials and and gen z who are starting to come into law firms now are looking for they are they have grown up where their guardians and their parents have made investments in them they love learning they've been taught 
Um, they've had benchmarks. And so, yeah. you know, and look, I mean, you can complain about it and boomers and Gen Xers can, can complain about it and millennials complain about Gen Xers and boomers. It's all, it's all good. It's all normal. Um, but I think that, that understanding that these folks are coming into the workplace, they want to grow mm -hmm. in general, right? They want to grow, they want to learn. And so mm -hmm. you have an opportunity to let them know that, yes, you are part of this firm. You are part of this culture. We do want to retain you here. We are willing to invest in you, right? We are willing to help you figure out what comes next for you and learn those skills and give you stretch assignments that we are confident that you will be able to take on. Um, yeah. And not just let them sit in their offices, grinding out the work and being invisible. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, that's one of the things that I, I've really appreciated about what we do here at Spotlight Branding is, you know, it, like people come here, they're not just collecting a paycheck, right? Like there's, there's that culture of, you know, pursue your passions or, you know, if you want to take a course, let us know and, and we'll, we'll cover it, you know, and, and help you, you know, develop skills that will help make you more efficient in your seat or to help you maybe take on more responsibility so that you can then maybe elevate and, and make more money down the road, you know? And so, and that's to your point. Yeah. Like people, people don't want to just show up to work to make a paycheck. Like they want to contribute. They want to feel like they belong and they, and, and they want more of that two-way street that, you know, with wherever they're working at. You mentioned that I have a podcast and I actually just this morning <laughs> recorded an episode with a managing partner of a 35 lawyer law firm in, in Toronto. And we were talking about this idea that some law firms now are saying, you know what, we don't want to hire really junior people because they're so expensive. We don't want to invest all kinds of time, money, and energy. We'll hire them later when somebody else has done the training and that kind of thing. And so look, it's understandable, right? It, I mean, we know that human resources are often an organization's biggest expense. And so for some, for some law firms, it may not make sense to hire um, super junior people. Having said that, the concept of we don't want to invest in people because they may leave and go somewhere else, or we don't want to invest in people because it's going to cost us something, I think is counterproductive. Um, it can it can be understandable, and yet it's not desirable. And so I encourage lawyers who are listening in and, and have that attitude to think about what does this look like, right? And And we're not suggesting that you send them out to a million conferences a year and just keep throwing money at them. There are ways to train your people um, and mentor and sponsor and make that investment of time and energy, even if it's not, you know, hard dollars and cents, um, that is going to reap you benefits. And so, yes, yeah. some of them are going to leave. We know that's the way it is. But does that mean that you don't want to grow internally and grow your firm and grow leaders simply because you may lose a little bit on one or two people? Yeah. And so I, I want to, you know, we've talked about the employee side of things. I want to, I want to touch on kind of the mindset of that business owner before we wrap up here. And I want to ask you about like how you can delegate, you know, that work and, and pass it off to someone else and trust them to do it. Uh, you know, we talk about how important that is. Like you can't do everything yourself, but, you know, and I, and I'm curious to, you know, get your thoughts on this, because this is a question that I have even like in my own, in my own role, where it's like, let's say that there's a world where a lawyer has delegated the bookkeeping, the marketing, like all of the non-legal stuff, they've delegated that out. They recognize that that's not what they're good at. And they're putting that in the hands of another expert. But then if you feel like you're the expert in doing the legal work, how do you delegate legal work to other people and still feel like you're being effective and being the best lawyer that you could be? I love this question. There's so much to unpack here. Okay, so <laughs> a couple of things. First of all, you mentioned that lawyers are highly intelligent and they are, yeah. right? They've done well in school. They're academically inclined. They're really good at learning and they're really good at executing. And so what happens is, and I will say this in, you know, I do a lot of speaking for lawyer groups and I'll say this in a room and I'll just say the following. If I want done, if I want something done right and the whole room will say at the same time, I have to do it myself, right? Because yeah. that's kind of the mantra of lawyers is that I'm smart. I trust myself. I know I do good work. 
Um, and if I give it to somebody else, it's not going to be done the way I would do it. What if it's not perfect? Because there's a, a perfectionism uh, train that runs right through the legal profession. Um, yeah. And by the way, if I delegate it to someone, it's going to take me more time to explain it to them than it would for me to do it myself. Right. So yeah. I hear this all the time. You know, if I had a nickel for every time I heard this, I would be a very wealthy woman. So here's the thing. No lawyer has ever, you know, earned absolute top compensation, become managing partner of a law firm, brought in tons of business who wanted to do it all him or herself. You cannot be the person who's sitting up at three o'clock in the morning, proofreading documents and be the leader of your firm, right? There are things that have to get delegated out to other people. And so the second thing I would say is delegation is not abdication. There's a difference between those two things. And you mentioned the idea of delegating tasks out to, you know, for bookkeeping or for marketing or HR, whatever it may be. Even though you are hiring experts to do those things, you are still not abdicating responsibility. All of those things have to be done in accordance with the firm's values and the firm's vision and mission and all of those sorts of things, because otherwise it's not right for your firm. In the same way, you can delegate legal work out to people um, and it, you're not necessarily abdicating it and just saying, well, you know, you're not necessarily totally qualified yet, but sure, go off and run with it and, you know, do whatever you want. So I think that this goes back to the investment concept. When you delegate to other people, yes, it does take time to teach them and train them and make sure they're doing it the XYZ law firm way, right? Or your way. At the same time, it's an investment that will pay dividends. If you were able to free yourself up for the highest and best use of your time, that's where the investment pays off. So as an example, I have people say to me all the time, because I, you know, I do a tremendous amount of business development work with, with law firms and individual lawyers. You don't understand, Elise, I can't find time to do this stuff. Again, it's the number one comment that I hear from lawyers when it comes to business development. The thing is that if you're not delegating, if you feel like you have to hold on to everything yourself and do it yourself, you, you won't have the time. You're not going to be able to create, we all have the same 24 seven. So it's a question of what are you doing with your time? And if you are proofreading documents, if you are doing all of your own bills, if you are um, you know, answering every email, no matter how immaterial it is, right? If you're drafting low level documents that somebody else could be drafting, you are not freeing up your time for the highest and best use, which is probably doing the high, which is probably one of three things, doing the high value, the high level legal work that only you can do, running the firm and developing the business, yeah. right? And so you get stuck in a cycle. And so what I say is, find the right person to whom to delegate, train that person, give them deadlines to come back and talk to you. Don't shoot the messenger when they do something that you don't like, explain to them, you know, it, it's really a teaching process. Make sure those lines of communication are kept open and that they're coming back to you. And over time, you're training them to do work in a way that makes sense for the firm and in a way that allows you to do the things that only you can do, that only you're meant to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, I, I'm, as I'm hearing this, it's like, I almost hear like lawyer voices in the back. It's like, well, I don't have time to train people. I don't even have time to get all of this set up. And it's like, yeah, there's going to be a time investment up front to get all of this stuff systematized and, and set up so that you can hand it off. But God, the, the amount that you will gain back in the weeks and months and years after that is going to yeah. be life changing. Remarkable. And I've seen it, I've seen it happen so many times. I have one client who is a trust and estates lawyer, and he's in his early 50s. And he said to me, like, I can bring in so much more business, but I don't have time to do it. Right. Yeah. So what would happen if all of a sudden you brought in this amazing client or a, a series of amazing clients? And you either did a terrible job or you had to turn them away because you simply couldn't get to the work. So what we wound up doing is over a period of time, developed a system for what happens when a new trust and estates matter comes in. And look, some of them aren't going to fit you know, the, the structure because some of them yeah. are going to be very unique 
matters. Um, he has very high net worth clients. And so they, de- we, you know, we talked about a system and developed a system. So there's somebody who does some intake and there are certain forms that have to get filled out and questions that have to get answered. It goes to a paralegal. There are a bunch of things that happen there. The paralegal meets with the attorney you know, a couple of times a week to go over all of the matters. The attorney meets with the client a certain number of times. The expectation is the attorney will meet with the client a certain number of times to get the understanding of what's going on with the client and their family and all of that sort of thing. But what's happened is he's been able to grow his business dramatically and still provide exceptional service and perhaps more exceptional service to his clients because he took the time to set that up. And it doesn't happen overnight. So you've got to, you can't, have that instant gratification mentality when you want to grow. It's it's not a one time thing. It's it's a it's a you know, it's kind of a marathon, not a sprint to some extent. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And and you know it it that that sentiment carries over into. I mean, I we see it all the time in marketing as well. You know, like people want expect overnight results, and it's like no, you got to build that momentum, and it takes some time, but it's really tough when the society we live in right now is so full of instant gratification and it just like people's patience is just not nearly what it used to be. I just saw a post on LinkedIn that someone put on about this idea that it takes a long time. It was a a LinkedIn branding expert who talked about it taking her 10 years to grow this incredible following of like 50,000 people or something. And that people think it happened overnight. And someone commented, the only thing that's instant is oatmeal. And for some reason that just struck me as hilarious, but it it really does go to all the things that we've been talking about today. Yeah, absolutely. So I I mean, a ton of great insight here. Um, You know, as as always, how can people learn more about Lawyer's Edge and, and get in touch with you? Yeah. So people, I would love to meet you if you're interested in saying hello. Um, you can visit us at our website, which is thelawyersedge.com. Um, and you can also find me on LinkedIn. I hang out there quite a bit as well. And uh, so definitely reach out and say hi. Awesome. Love it. Well, that is going to do it for us here this week on Center Stage. Uh, appreciate so much all the feedback and, and all of the uh, the notes that you guys have been sending in. Um, that's going to do it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. To learn more, go to spotlightbranding.com slash center stage.